have. <laughs> And turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 19. Uh, again, we'll, we're going to be picking up Sunday school here shortly. Whether it's next Sunday or not, we'll, uh, we'll uh, let you know a little more fully either during the week or next Sunday. <laughs> and uh, in the meantime, Sunday night, Sunday school time. So, Revelation chapter 19, the end of the tribulation period, it ends with the, the false prophet, the Antichrist, being taken. God deals with them in a summary, uh, summary fashion, uh, putting them away. We're going to read through some of these things, and then through uh, chapter 20. Uh, the problem most people have is they don't have any context for the judgments of God, where they fall, how they come. And uh, therefore, they look at uh, Revelation chapter 20, since they're reading all of the other thing, it's just, well, it's just Bible stories. And they don't read the truth or the, uh, the dynamics of it. And they get to chapter 20 and they find out that everybody is raised and uh, uh, stands before God and gets judged. Uh, and their, their typical Protestantism is to find out if they made it or not, to see if their baptism worked, if their uh, Calvinism worked, to see if they're holding on to whatever it is they got worked, see if the... Uh, they're praying through work and uh, Methodism and all that kind of business. And it never occurs to them that that's not a judgment for saved people. That's a judgment for lost people. The judgment for the saved is long since uh, uh, passed, at least in any sense of the church, that they could be involved in. All right, so we're going to start reading down here in verse uh, uh, chapter 19 and verse 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Uh, as you read through uh, uh, all of the Old Testament, you find that there's a conflict at the end of the ages that ends with uh, uh, this gigantic battle, uh, the Battle of Armageddon, or uh, uh, the, uh, the final assault. It's a, a theme that movie uh, producers have grabbed onto and book writers have uh, uh, latched onto. And it's, it's sort of a, a catchphrase for the final consummation of, uh, of things. And uh, indeed it is as far as this goes. And uh, in God's terms, he makes war against uh, uh, these people, but it's all of the nations that we've been reading about in our uh, uh, Deuteronomy studies and how it's going to end at the end about the God putting hooks in the jaws of the nation, drawing them down to Jerusalem for a slaughter. And you know, this, this nation doesn't, this world doesn't end in some big revival meeting. It doesn't end in everybody singing, sitting around a campfire, swaying and singing Kumbaya. It ends in a war that probably wipes out about three-fourths at least of the world's population. Uh, and uh, uh, putting the Jews into the ascendancy over all nations, uh, a Jewish king on the throne of, uh, of his glory and ruling over the nations, and everyone becoming subservient to him. And to the world, that is distasteful. That is the root cause of anti-Semitism. Uh, they think the Jews dreamed this up, but uh, when it was offered to them, the Jews didn't even want it. They wanted Caesar to be their king. They didn't want their rightful king. But he goes on here about what the end of the beast and the false prophet are in verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet. So it shows you these are two distinct people. Some people want to make them one. That wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These are real things. These are not spiritual uh, claims. These are not having a uh, uh, RFID uh, receiver injected into your hand. That'd be a bad idea from my point of view, but uh, this goes way deeper than that. Uh, uh, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant that were slain with the sword of him that sat on the horse, upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. That sword is the word of God. Uh, if God can create the world by speaking, if sons come into existence at his command, uh, he doesn't have to go to any great lengths to destroy the kings of the earth. He just speaks and judgment falls on these, these people. Uh, what that looks like is uh, uh, yet to be seen, but it's a bloodbath, uh, no, no less. Chapter 20 begins, and uh, 
there's a uh, an event at the end of this that's uh, that's kind of interesting. The beast at some point, uh, according to Matthew uh, 24, I believe it's verse 15, the the Antichrist is filled with the spirit of the devil, and he becomes literally the sa the satanic embodiment of uh, of the satanic trinity. He's a spirit, soul, and body of uh, of a devil. Uh, but that devil is a separate entity, just like God is a separate entity from you and I, though he can dwell in us. It says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan. They, those are not several different people, I don't believe. They're just one ongoing uh, description of the same individual. And bound him a thousand years. That binding of the devil for a thousand years is the beginning of the millennium. That puts the devil away. So for the next thousand years, man will not have the devil to blame on their their disobedience, their rebellion, their failures, their shortcomings, their their uh, hypocritical natures on all of their their moral and spiritual failures. They'll have no one to blame but themselves. They will have to accept the consequences of that. Uh, verse 3, it says, And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till. Now that word T-I-L-L -L, or until at times, this way it's put, signifies that at some point something's going to change about that circumstance. So what is it? Well, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, after that, he must be loosed for a little season. So at the end of that thousand years, the devil's turned loose on the world again. You say, what in the world would God do that for? Because after a thousand years of perfect uh, political reign, after a thousand years of uh, 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 Christ-filled, I'm trying to think of a way to say this that doesn't make it sound too high and mighty, uh, resurrected glorified saints that have been ruling as judges over the cities of the earth, there are still men that when the devil is released, as we're going to see here shortly, rise up against the Lord and his Christ. You think, why in the world would they do that? Because man's nature is unchanged by the removal of the devil. That stain of sin has gone into man. Every man must be born again or must be spiritually uh, uh, converted uh, w under whatever method or, or means God requires at the particular time in order to meet God's standards, in order to rise above that sinful flesh. As far as you and I, we will have that resurrected body, which is the complete, full, spirit, soul, and body conversion. The rest of the world is still people just like we're sitting here now, flesh and blood. They're, they're living, breathing people. They're having children. They're raising families. They're uh, having farms. And uh, I don't know whether they're going to football games or anything like that, but uh, whatever else they're doing, they're just normal flesh and blood people. And when the devil again raises his head and begins to draw them out, there's a multitude that follow him. You know, people today, they blame, well, you know, the environment we live in, it's, it's the urban environment, it's that suburban environment that they have people that have things and everybody else doesn't have. No, it's just the same covetous, lustful, ungodly nature in man that Adam uh, uh, attained when he sinned. And it is unchanged until Christ changes those people. So at the end of this thousand years, that's the millennial reign. When Christ rules over the earth, uh, that's what we read about uh, last uh, Sunday. That's what we preached about last Sunday, about the throne of his glory. That lasts for a thousand years, and then the devil is released for this short season. By the way, if you've got a question, just stick your hand up, and we'll stop right as close as I can to where we're at and, and uh, try and uh, help you sort that out or, or uh, straighten out something I said that uh, wasn't quite right. And I saw thrones, verse 4. And they, uh, that sat, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. 
And I saw the soul. Now, this is interesting. Judgment is given to somebody else. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their, uh, their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Uh, during that thousand years, the parable of the, uh, the virgins there, some of them are prepared when he comes back. Some of them aren't prepared. There's a remnant of Israel that's waiting for the bridegroom to return. There's also, as uh, John the Baptist was, the herald that announces the Lord Jesus Christ coming suddenly uh, to show up for his people. Uh, Paul uh, says in his conversion, he was as one born out of due time. So he's a Jewish man on his way serving uh, uh, Judaism and is confronted face to face and personally by the Lord Jesus Christ and given apostolic signs, powers, wonders, and miracles as a testimony to the Jews and by extension everybody else in the world at this point. Uh, and they, became a, they become a means whereby uh, there's a great multitude saved out of that tribulation that no man could number, both Jews and Gentiles. And uh, they become uh, the same as Paul, who could be stoned and shipwrecked and beaten and all those things, and then just get up and kind of dust himself off and go right back at it. Until his time was finished, he couldn't be killed. God's pretty, uh, pretty powerful. You know, you never want to sell him short on what he can see you through. All right, so and these, uh, by the way, these walk with the Lord. During that thousand years, they are not the church. They are not Jehovah Witnesses. They are not Mormons. They are not some cultic group. They are a group of people who are yet to be saved. They are described in Revelation chapter 7 as 144,000 Jewish male virgins who are singled out by God. God knows what tribe they're from. God knows their their. Uh, uh, physical status. He knows their spiritual makeup and he selects out of all of the Jews left those young men to be those, uh, those witnesses. But he says in verse 5, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. So it looks like those uh, that were caught up to heaven, the, the martyrs there, that 144,000 uh, may come back with the church, may come back with the Lord. They may be raised from the dead. Uh, there's some of this stuff. Uh, man, uh, you read a lot of stuff. Everybody, oh, well, you know, it's right in this little slot here. Uh, God bless them if they got all that stuff. I, I'm still kind of looking at that and saying, I'm not sure exactly how all that works out. All I know is what God says, how it gets to that. Uh, Maybe a little iffy to me. Uh, but anyway, the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So then, to complete the first resurrection has to be, as 1 Corinthians 15, first there's the first fruits. That's Jesus Christ. And I, I guess you would have to include those that rose from the grave when his grave opened and wandered around Jerusalem for a bit. Anybody ever figure out who they are? <laughs> That'd be interesting, wouldn't it? I have no idea who they were. I need, no, neither does anybody. I mean, you could, your speculation, I guess, would be as good as anybody's. Anyway, that's, that's the Christ in the first fruits. Then them that are his and his coming. And then there's gleanings. You know, after the, after the main harvest is gone, there's gleanings. That's what's in the corners of the field. That's what's left over for the others that are, that are in need after he comes. So I may, that may be that 144,000 that are, that are raised uh, raised up there. But at any rate, that first resurrection is called the resurrection of the just. Now that's, that's pretty interesting because if it's the resurrection of the just, then it would have to take in almost everybody you would think. But what about anybody who dies in righteousness during that thousand years? Where do they come up? Where do they live? Do you think no one dies at all for a thousand years? I don't, it, I mean, it doesn't say specifically one way or another. And I think you're, uh, I, let me tell you why I'm circling the wagon on this. How many of you have heard that uh, Revelation 20 verse uh, uh, 12 through 15 is only for the lost, only unsaved people? The white throne judgment, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. 
because if it isn't, where does anybody else ever get raised? There's never mentioned another calling anybody else to, to God's throne for anything. Now, maybe it happens. Maybe, maybe I've just missed it somewhere. If somebody's got the key to that. Just let me know. Um, I'm ready to listen. All right, so they reign with him a thousand years. Verse 7, and when the thousand years are expired, you know the people that, uh, that are the uh, post-millennialists or amillennialists. Amillennial is you put an A in front of something that negates it. Like if you're sent, you're going. If you're absent, you're not there. <laughs> uh, so put an A in front of that means there is no millennium. And the Jehovah Witnesses believe that uh, the millennium was coming in 1914 until World War I started. That kind of spoiled the, the perfection of the world. Then they thought it was coming in 1918 when it ended. And a lot of the other global uh, daydreaming liars uh, kind of picked that up as, oh, boy, that's the war to end all wars until World War II came along. And all the ones in between those things. And uh, after that, they kind of calmed down. They, their predictions went on, but uh, they didn't mean anything any more than they did before. So when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, just like we read before. And he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. So there's still an earth. There's still nations in it. There are still people that are separate from Israel, separate from Christ. It isn't one big Israeli camp. Uh, it's, it's the world, but they have a head that uh, is the king of kings. These, these nations, I uh, suspect, are no longer republics or democracies, but would be monarchs. Anybody know why I would say that? Because Jesus isn't king over the president. He's king of kings. He's the lord of lords. That, that's that's an, either an aristocracy or a monarchy, however you want to cut it. Uh, but he's, he's done away with this idea of everybody doing what you want. It's a world that is dictated uh, by the answer to what's called the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And uh, there be people that resent that fact. They don't know any better. Uh, just like the people today running around shouting about, we need uh, socialism, we need communism, we need this. Uh, these people have no idea what that has brought. Every place that it showed up at any level and any degree to which it was adhered to, all it brought was murder, famine, death, destruction, just ruin. So, and shall go out to deceive the nations. Well, why would he deceive the nations? Because he's a deceiver, and that's what he does. You look at all these cults, what's the problem with them? They're deceived. They believe a false Bible. They believe false doctrine. They believe false leaders. Uh, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, that would be their leader. We read about Gog and Magog back in Ezekiel. Uh, but it simply is a leader and the followers of that leader to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. How in the world after a thousand years of perfection? Nobody's going hungry. Nobody's, nobody's starving to death. Nobody's freezing to death. Nobody's having a hard time. Everybody's doing really well. You say, what in the world would lead men to do that? The wicked heart. Same thing as it leads men to rebel today. Uh, and this number of them is as the sand of the sea. You wouldn't think you could, you could drag up that many wicked people out of that, uh, out of that blessed uh, uh, millennium. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. Anybody want to take a guess at what that beloved city is? I bet it's not Chicago. <laughs> I, I think the only thing you could reasonably assume there is it's Jerusalem. Uh, and look at how God handles this. Uh, they they uh, compass the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. You notice there's no battle there. God just allows them to gather them, to get them all together in one spot. That's it. Burning up the chaff. God says, I'm not concerned with them. They had their chance. They've seen everything. There was no faith required during millennium. You could see God reigning, controlling the weather. You could see God dispensing mercy and everything that people needed and blessings. And you rejected it anyway. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. 
after a thousand years, they are still there. They are still in torments. They are still burning. They are still screaming. They have not been released from that. They were not annihilated as the uh, some of the Seventh-day Adventists and the, the Jehovah Witnesses claim. Uh, they didn't disappear as the Mormons uh, claim. They are in the lake of, uh, they are in the, uh, the uh, lake of fire burning. Why is that? Because the, the lake of fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. It was not made for man. Man, by a failure to follow Christ, goes to the only default there is for sin. That is to be burned and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's a long time. You know, when people think, well, I'm going to be in hell with my friends. Well, maybe you will be, but you won't be enjoying it. You think you're going to go there and party? You think you're going to go there and have a good time? You're not going to have any such thing like that. What you're going to be doing there is screaming. I, I saw a picture today. Uh, Kathy Gipp posted it. Anybody remember that... Uh, really date myself. There was a picture that, that rose to just world status during the Vietnam War. And it was a little girl, I would guess she was maybe five or six, running down the road. Her clothes had been burned off of her by napalm. I mean, it was a horrifying picture. That, that little girl was running down the road just, just screaming and these, you could see her skin peeling and stuff from the, from the burns. That little girl's testimony now as a full-grown woman, the fire of that napalm led me to Christ. You think, man, everything is, in war is bad? Well, I, listen, you'd be hard-pressed to say, oh, and that's a great thing. It's great that she got saved, isn't it? If there was no other way for her to get saved, I bet she thanks God for every drop of napalm that ever fell. And you know what? In eternity, she will too. Because she'll see what comes of not trusting him. It's that napalm that has no end. It's that burning that has no conclusion or no relief or no, not even death can separate you from it. This idea that you're going to be annihilated, the idea that it's all going to go away some point, boy, that's a, that's a lost man's delusion. God said, just as uh, sin is eternal, my blessings are eternal. My blood is eternal. My salvation is eternal. And so is hell. You get what you want. You don't want Christ, you'll get what you want, a place without him. A lady went by the other day, said something about what we were doing. I said, gospel and preached in hell. You won't have to hear it there. That's, that's sad, but people get, God's going to give everybody what they want. You want eternal life in Christ? It's yours. Now, you'd think that word where the beast and the false prophet are would be enough to settle every argument on whether there's a, a real burning hell. But people, they don't believe the Bible. It doesn't matter what the Bible says. They don't believe it. They just say they believe it. Verse 11, And I saw a great white throne. Anybody know what white would signify? Isn't that purity? Man, I got a message on Solomon's throne, an ivory throne. And poor elephants that gave up their teeth for that. <laughs> Purity. And him that sat on it. What a sight that must be. From whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. Let me, let me just stop there. If there's no heaven and earth but just this throne, what are you standing on when you're before God? Anybody want to make a wild stab at that? As far as I can see, you're not standing on anything. You're just hanging there. <laughs> Anybody ever read Jonathan Edwards' uh, sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God? That's exactly what he tried to picture there. And people back in those days had enough sense of hell that they said that the people that were sitting there, and he, you know he, how he gave that sermon? He read it. He didn't preach it with all this fire and brimstone. He just read the thing. And he's talking about a God that's holding a man over a fire like a worm. 
And whether that worm's going to drop into that fire or whether it's going to drop into that man's, that God's hands and be saved. And they said the people in there, they, they, they claimed they could literally smell sulfur. The, the conviction was so, so serious. They could, they could feel the heat coming up. Some of them even said it felt like the floor was tilting where they were going to slide into, into hell. And it began one of the great revivals of New England. You realize today you couldn't scare people with that if you preached on that every sermon for the next three years? Well, God is love. Jesus loves me. I'm, I'm just, just, he just accepts me the way I am. Boy, that, uh, that familiarity with a holy God can be dangerous. Very dangerous. All right, so who's there? I saw the dead, small and great. The graves are emptied out, just like there's a resurrection. And the first resurrection is the resurrection to life and of the just. The second resurrection is a resurrection of the dead to judgment. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. That's kind of interesting. Uh, God still uses books. Here's a God that doesn't forget anything. Here's a God that knows the hairs on your head, but he's not even trusting his memory. You know what he's trusting? Let me flip this book open, see what it says here. I want you to read this along with me. You realize that a lost man, when he hears the list of why he's, he's going to go to hell, can't say anything but amen, Jesus Christ is Lord. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's what I did. That's me. That's the way I was thinking. What a terrifying prospect. And these people think, well, God knows my heart. <laughs> man, if that don't scare you, uh, you don't understand what that means. Okay, so these books are open. One is uh, uh, a book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. So is your name in the book of life? Mm, no, name doesn't show up here. Verse 15 says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. How do you get your name in the book of life? Well, Jesus' disciples, they went out and it wasn't spiritual power. We, went out, we cast out devils. The devils listened to us. We healed people. And Jesus said, ah, good for you. But you better rejoice because your name's in the book of life. I think what's in there is the blood of Jesus Christ writes your name in there when you get saved. It can't be taken out because that blood is eternal. If it isn't in there, uh, Moses prayed that his name wouldn't be blotted out of the book. And he says, don't worry about that. It ain't going to be blotted out. If it's in there, it's in there. If it isn't, it isn't, and it doesn't appear. That's why lost people don't have a name. Once they die, everything's blotted out of their life. They're, they're just gone. God's still got their acts in the book. God still knows who they are, but there's uh, no identification with it. All right, so uh, they're judged out of these things according to their works. So, uh, you know what this is? This is a payroll ledger. Anybody know why I say that? What did that lady say the other day? Yeah. She's, 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 yeah. Now listen, if you're working for something, don't you want it recorded? You don't want it to go to waste. God says, I... Your life is important to me. I'm going to count everything you do. And a proud man says, yeah. And then when the Lord opens that book and he reads it. Now picture this. Here's a, the holy God of creation reading your sins. Anybody in here ever done anything that uh, if it was all published in a newspaper, you'd want your mother to read it to your family? <laughs> that, that's an interesting <laughs> no. And here's a God who's probably sitting there with his face blushing as he reads this stuff about, that's you? You think you should be in heaven? Well, I'm going to tell God what I think. What did Bloomfield say? If there's a heaven, when I get there, I'm going to tell God. I'm just going to walk right in. No, you ain't. If you had all your, uh, all your money in something fireproof, it still wouldn't do you any good. It'd be in hell with you. 
All right, so uh, according to their works, you want a paycheck? There it is. Uh, I'll, I'll take uh, trusting the Lord. I was telling somebody something the other day. Guy was uh, telling me he was going to ask such and such for it. And I said, why don't you let them give you an offer? I said, sometimes it's surprising. You know, you, you think, well, I'm going to set the price at this. You know, it's surprising sometimes how people estimate greater than what you think it's, it's something's worth or greater than what you think. Imagine when you, when you tell the Lord, you know, well, you owe me because of what I've done. And the Lord says, well, well, let's take a look here. But imagine this, when you, you stand before the Lord and say, Lord, I didn't do anything for you. I just trusted you. And he says, I'll take that. That's, that's gold. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Anybody know how many people have drowned over the years? How many bodies have been buried at sea? How many people have been swept into the ocean? I mean, any, anybody know how many people other than eight were drowned in that flood? God does. Every single one of them is accounted for. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. So the bodies are coming. The spirits are coming. The souls of those men are coming. Uh, hell delivered up the dead. They've been held captive since Adam's sin. That made a place for, for lost men to go, whether it was made at the same time or the first man that died, uh, whatever. That's where he went. Abraham's bosom, I suspect uh, Abel went there. And when Cain died, he went to the other side just so that they could have uh, uh, equal uh, people in there. They, uh, they give up the dead that are in them to stand before God. And those people might think, oh boy, I'm out of that fire. And you can just, just kind of picture the scene here. Here's somebody who's been in hell for, man, imagine that. Some of these people have been in hell for 6,000 years. And for the first time, no fire. Oh, this is great. And the Lord said, uh, your name's not in the book of life. Well, what does that mean? Well, you're not going to be in hell anymore. Yeah, I got, some, I got some good news and some bad news. You're not going to be in hell anymore. You're going to be in a lake of fire forever. Hell is going to be thrown in there. I got to even get rid of hell. I don't even want it on my earth because I'm going to create a new heaven and a new earth and hell ain't going to be there. It's going to be just a place of purity. So he says they were judging... Uh, See, gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So we talk about people going to hell. That's where they're going now. At the end of the millennium, uh, uh, the people that rebel against God at the, uh, when the devil's released there for that season, they don't die and go to hell because hell doesn't exist anymore as a place separately from indigo. They'll go to the lake of fire. They go directly to their eternal state. All the final judgment has been passed. Uh, this is the second death. Just like there's a second birth. You know, born once, die, uh, die twice. Born twice, die once. So a lost man dies bodily. He's been dead spiritually already at birth, but he dies bodily, and then he dies spiritually. That spiritual death is the one that goes forever. This flesh is, uh, I want to say it's temporary, because these people are not there in a, in a body like this one. They've been given a body, the Bible says, outfitted for destruction. Jehovah Witness say, well, a body couldn't stand that kind of heat for, for all that time. No, it can't, but uh, rest assured, the proper body for the circumstance will be provided. And whosoever was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So, here's what we find. At the end of the millennium, after that thousand years, there's a judgment where the lost of all ages will go. Anybody know why there's no more judgments for the dead after Revelation 20? There's no more death. There's no more death. We read in there in uh, chapter 21, 
verse 3, it says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. This isn't just Israel. This isn't just the church. This is everybody that's alive, everybody that will ever be alive evermore. And there shall be no more death. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 26. That last enemy to be put away is death. Sin's been put away in the blood of Christ, but death is still a consequence to this flesh. Once that second judgment has come, the second death has come, nobody's going to die anymore. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat on the, upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are highly allegorical and figurative. <laughs> now he said they're faithful and true. They're not just something, well, that would be nice. It would be nice, and it will be nice when it happens, and it's going to happen just like you said. So, books are open. Men are judged out of those things. You and I are in the book of life. There's a book of life that goes all the way back to probably Adam, and every man that uh, God accepted has been put in that book, and every man that rejected God, you notice I didn't say that God rejected, but every man that rejected God goes in another book, and it's a book of works, because he's not depending on God, not trusting God, depending on himself. He can't go to heaven. He can't have any righteousness of his own. So there's, uh, uh, th there's nobody here that you read about that is saved by grace through faith at that throne. Jim? Yep. That's exactly how I picture it. I, I, my, my scene of that is this. There's, and you're in eternity, so the time doesn't mean anything. That, that's, that's not even an issue with anything. How long is it going to take to judge all those people? Well, there isn't any time in eternity. Time is for this life. Eternity, there isn't any. At least not there. Here's this great white throne. Lord's sitting on it. Somebody comes up there. And he, you ever see any of the old medieval things? They open a book as big as this. And in that is that person's entire life. Every significant thing that ever happened to them. Every time somebody gave them a witness. Every time they heard a, a line in a, in a movie that might have made them think of something spiritual. Every time they had a wicked thought is put in there. Every time uh, somebody said, I'll pray for you, and they just kind of in their heart chuckled or said, well, that would be nice, you know, humoring somebody. Every bit of that. Not only that, I picture it like this. Who, who else is at that scene beside those people that have been, that are there to be judged? All of the saints are there. So as those people are walking down this aisle, they get a, and this is, boy, this is, if this don't convict you, you're dead. As they go walking down the, oh, well, there's, there's my next door neighbor. How come you're not in this line? Oh, I was saved. Well, why didn't you ever tell me? Well, you know, I, I wanted to be a good neighbor. I just wanted to be nice, wanted to get along. Didn't, didn't want to upset you. Just, just, you know, say, well, that's, that's a pretty wishy-washy Christian. Yeah, but Christian, <laughs> wishy-washy or otherwise, is on the right side of that equation, aren't they? Well, you're not kidding. Just imagine see some of your family members that wouldn't get saved. That, that, listen, I don't care how long you've been saved or how long you've been in heaven. If that, especially there, knowing what's coming next for them, if that doesn't tear your heart apart, you're not a human being. And to see that, God says, I'm going to wipe away every tear. Because you know what? As much responsibility as you and I have, and as much as the preacher wants to lay on you, <laughs> they still have their own, don't they? I mean, they don't need you to get saved. They don't need a church to get saved. They could get saved walking down the street seeing a sign on the corner. 
Jesus Christ died that you might have eternal life. They, they are without excuse. You know, there, there's a verse back in Luke, uh, and it said, uh, it's, it's given as an example of an unfaithful servant. It says, those that have been faithful in few things are beaten with few stripes. And those that are, that are unfaithful, many things are beaten with many stripes. And, of course, the Catholic Church kind of latches onto something like that as well. That's purgatory. Uh, it's not purgatory, but apparently there are degrees of hell. And I, which is the best? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm not sure there is such a thing as the best. There may be some better or different or whatever than the others. But uh, you don't want to be in any of them when the opportunity to be in heaven and glory with the Lord is ever present. So this judgment is for the lost. It'll be in a place where there's no heaven or no earth. It has to be either in heaven or space. But it says that the, heaven and the, earth, the heavens and the earth fled away. Uh, we read that somewhere back here. Verse 11, uh, from whose faith the earth and the heaven fled away. So I take it all physical things for, for at least a brief period are gone. Anybody know why the heaven would be fled away? Because in this judgment... The Bible says back in the book of Job, even the heavens are not clean in God's sight. In Satan's rebellion, even the heavens became stained with sin. You know, they, they send these rockets out there and they look at planets and blown up asteroids and all this kind of stuff. Did you ever wonder what it was when God made it? Was it like that? Just empty and void. I, uh, I'm not saying there are people out there or aliens. Uh, God help us for that. But I mean, maybe he made it something different and sin came in there and the entire universe was wrecked. This, this is a battle that has no dimensions given on it. It goes to the end of everything. That's why everything, like in Noah's day, the end of all flesh has come upon me. Only Noah was perfect in his generations. As far as God's concerned, Satan's a prince in the power of the air. He's, he's the God of everything that fell in, in sin. So it all had to be done. So there's a new heavens and a new earth. Everything out there is made new. And everything out there is made new because if you still have, and these, these people that walk through this thousand years that are alive, they're going to be physically alive forever. They are like Adam was, living by a garden, living by a river, eating the fruit of the trees of life, which bore 12 manners of fruit. And it was for the healing of the nations endlessly. Well, it doesn't take long before you'd fill up a world if you had people uh, with multiple childbirth and no death and no sin and no war. Got to have some place to send them. I think the Mormons kind of kind of grabbed onto that just a bit. And they, they created a, uh, an, uh, every Mormon man that's baptized in a Mormon temple, read that, paid up your money, uh, is going to have a planet and he's going to have his harem and they're going to produce children to populate that earth. Crazy world, but I think that may not, not a harem, but a, a bride, may not be that far from the truth for those people that go through there. And you and I will always be by the, by the Lamb's side throughout eternity. So it's from the loss from Adam all the way through the church period. It's the unrighteous dead who died during the tribulation in the millennium. It's uh, children in the millennium, according to Isaiah 65, who uh, might live to be 100 years old but die. There has to be a judgment for them somewhere. Now, whether, whether any death in the millennium is because of sin, I, I don't know. Accidents could still be a very present reality. Uh, you die of something. There has to be a place to raise them. Um, I, I presented this before. Look back with me in Revelation 11. We'll be done here in just a second. Revelation 11. And I'm not sure how this fits. I've read as, as many books, commentaries, and opinions and stuff on it as I could find, which are precious few. Most of them, anything you come to that you can't figure out, the most brilliant Greek and Hebrew scholars haven't either. They just make up something if they want to even comment on it. And if not, they just go over it like it wasn't even there and don't even say, I don't even know what that means. 
in the Revelation chapter 11 and verse uh, 15. And the seventh angel sounded. This is during the tribulation when this is seen. Uh, and great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. That is opposed to the devil's Christ, the anointed cherub that covers. And He shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats uh, fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come. That kind of looks to a future when He's coming. But the rest of the verse is, Because thou hast taken, well, they're still waiting because He's come to take it, but now it's has taken, that's history, to thee thy great power and hast reigned. Is that the thousand years? And the nations were angry, and the time of uh, thy wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged? Well, that's clearly Revelation 20 that we just read about, because that's where all that judgment takes place. And, and, that thou shouldest give reward to thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. Is that Revelation 20, verse 13 through 15? Or is that a, something different than that? If that's Revelation 20, which it certainly seems to fit, there's some people that, uh, that are raised up there that are resurrected that get rewards. You don't, you don't read anywhere else where the prophets are rewarded. The, the Bible says of Jesus, he talked to them about uh, uh, when the Son of Man's come, they would sit down in the kingdom having fellowship with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. David is said to be there, whether that's literally David or David's line, I, I'm assuming it's David. But it looks like there's still others to be rewarded. When do they come into the picture? The beginning of the millennium? Is, is that? Got me. It's just not clear. I mean, you can fit them in there wherever you want. Uh, and the temple of God was open in heaven. There was a, a scene in the temple, the ark of his testament. There were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. That's typically taken as the end of the tribulation because there's four accounts of the tribulation ending through the book of Revelation from 5 all the way through 19. And each one of them, and each one of them ends in an earthquake and the Lord coming. He didn't come four times. How many Gospels are there? What, how many corners of the earth are there? Four. So each time you see that, this is the world ending on that, on that scale. So I think those trumpets and vials, and they all are sort of uh, synchronous or simultaneous, as however you want to look at that. And uh, it all ends in the same way. Catastrophe for the lost, glory for the saved. Bible says, every knee shall bow. He's not just whistling Dixie. Look with me back in uh, Isaiah 66, and we'll be done. There's some things back here that, uh, well, it's, it's some, some amazing things. <laughs> I was talking with Jan, we were talking about Sunday school, and you know, for a Sunday school teacher, there's so many lessons in that Old Testament. You know, you want to teach your kids how to be kind and how to be nice and how to be good and be sweet and be all those kind of things. And God killed this guy and cut off the heads of his enemies and hung them on the wall. And, and whoa, <laughs> it's, it's like reading the Psalms to somebody in a hospital bed. You go from the sweet care and uh, mercies of God to God will, God will uh, tear off the limbs of the wicked. <laughs> Isaiah 66, uh, verse 15, For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. 
Verse 18, For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory, and I will set a sign among them, and I will send those that escape to them unto the nations to uh, Tarshish, Pool, Lud, that draw the bow to Tubal and Javan, to the isles afar off, that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. That's probably that 144,000. For they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all the nations upon horses and in chariots, litters, and upon mules, and upon swift beasts, to my holy mountain Jerusalem, saith the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering and a clean vessel unto the house of the Lord. You know what he's saying there? When I come back, I'm going to send people out, and they're going to gather the children of Israel, and they're going to bring them back to Israel and give them, Lord, here's what we've given you. You remember the throne of His glory? Lord, when did we do that? When did we see that? It says, inasmuch as you did it to one of these, the least of my brethren, you've done it to me. He says, that's your entrance, your kindness to the people of Israel. So, verse 21, I will take of, the Levi, uh, take of them for priests and for Levites, saith the Lord, as for the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make shall remain before me, saith Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And I, it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh." Coming up the King's Highway, there's a place of burning. I believe it's Isaiah 34 that's put down there, and it just comes boiling up to the surface. And during that millennium, as they, they come up to worship the king, they can walk by there and look down into this like a boiling pot of sulfur, and they can see the carcasses of those people that transgressed the Lord just screaming and yelling down there. You think that doesn't have a uh, sort of a... Uh, 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 an effect on the human spirit and soul. But after you've seen that a thousand times, eh, I won't be in there. See, they've been in there all the time. I'm not, I'm not in there. It's amazing what people can uh, give themselves by way of delusions that they're going to escape God's wrath and judgment. A holy God has to execute judgment 100% or he becomes unholy. Good for us that he uh, keeps to his word. Well, it'll be terrifying to the lost. All right. Anybody got a question? Great day. Yes. The worm dies not. Here it says again the worms. Yeah. The worm, the body turns into a worm. Well, we get a body like our Savior, right? Yes. Maybe they get one like theirs. <laughs> Isn't a snake just another kind of worm? And then for the churchmen, when they stand before him, or they can kneel, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there, there's a resurrection that they come out of there. Yeah. The, yeah. So they get a body. Yeah. Where did you say it said that? You said there's a body fitted for them? Yeah, they're, they're, they're given a body to stand before the Lord. They're given a body. Yeah. There, there's a literal resurrection of those people. To bring them out. You gotta consider what they're what you're seeing here is a spiritual state of men. Their bodies are still on the ground. So what you see in there, and, and it's kind of weird if you think about what is the inner working of a man? And nobody could figure it out. According to the way the Bible reads, it's it's a non-physical, or at least non-visible part that looks like you. So you have a soul that has fingers and hands and when you look in heaven you see the souls of them that perished under the altar but there's no physical body so if there's no physical body there's no longer suffering but they're in there and they're suffering for whatever reason because God said so when they get out of that they have a, a brief respite they're put back in some kind of body that can stand in the presence of God God says okay out of the frying pan into the fire and they go. And the last thing they do is bow their knee to Jesus Christ is Lord. Think about this. 
The cults spend all their time trying to change things around so that they're never what the Bible says. The Jehovah Witnesses say Jesus wasn't resurrected in a real body. Isn't that interesting? You know what Romans 10, 9 says? You have to confess that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. Well, if he wasn't raised in a body, the spirit was still alive. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. They just twist and rest and, and corrupt, and uh, there's no end to it. All right. Aren't you glad you're saved? Hallelujah. All right, let's stand. All right, we'll, uh, we'll pick on maybe some better, happier notes here.